we'll work through this. I want, to work, I want you to work on this little exercise. What I have here, I have 10 packs of cards, okay? And you can see on your handout, there's two rows of 12 blank lines, right? So what I want, to, I want to get you guys into is I want you to form little groups, like 10 groups, preferably since I have 10 packs of cards, where you work together, and here's your assignment. I want you to take these 10 values that are on these cards, and I want you to fill them in in the order of importance that you think they are in the church, okay? So these are, these are church values. So they, this one says serving and volunteering, okay? I want you to put the one you think is the most important at the top and the one you think is the least, number 12, at the bottom, and make a list. And you do it as a group. Fill in your sheet as a group. Does it make sense so far? Matt. This is what you think it should be the first time. So the first time I want you to do for that first column that you have there, I want you, to, I want you as a group to agree on what you think it should be. So this is going to take a little negotiating, right? Typically, like a church meeting, kind of. Be exciting. And then the second, the second task you have is this. Then I want you to, on the second column, I want you to rank the order of how much time you spend in this church on each of these values. So, so you might think discipleship is the most important thing, but when you actually think about how much time you spend on it, it might fall sixth or seventh. See what I'm saying? So, uh, question right here, yeah. Well, you probably don't have to concur. What, I'll give you permission not to concur so that this doesn't take three hours, right? Because <laughs> chances are in a church like this, we're going to have a lot of disagreements. So I would say since each of you have your own sheet, you can discuss it together, use the cards together, maybe lay them out somewhere together. And then you can write on your own sheet maybe what you think the answer is, right? And do it that way. But you can at least talk about it as a group. So, so part of our day today is to be able to work together a little bit on some of these things. Not just be listeners, but be actively involved in learning. Make sense? So I'm going to give you permission even. If you want to go use a table in the other room, get a group around. I mean, I, I'm giving you permission to move around. I'm going to give you like 10 to 12 minutes to do this exercise. Okay? Then I'm going to call you back in here. All right? So I need 10 I need 10 people to be group leaders. So I'm going to assign Pastor Mac can be a group leader. Who else will be a group leader? Here we go, group leader. Here we go. J Jason, you got to be a group leader. Youth Pastor Man, you got to be a group leader. All right, right here. I need, I need uh, five more, five more people. Here we go. Okay, here we, go. we got some good leaders volunteering. I love it. Okay, now let me have uh, anyone else. Okay, I need two more. Two more right here. One more. Come on, one more people step up to the plate. Okay, you want to step with the plate? You already got one? You're good? All right. Okay, now, group leaders, you stand up, and let's gravitate toward these group leaders. So maybe there's three or four in each group, and go to work on this. Okay. Why don't we come back to our seats, and I want to hear what you got here. I want to hear what you got. I want to hear what you came up with. <laughs> this is a great exercise. What I'd love to do is that I should have had you go off by yourself and write down what you thought yeah. and then match it to these guys' responses to see how it was going. That would be real exciting. Yeah. We got one group, in the, they, they're insisting they're, they're going to finish. Here they come, I think. They, they might be rolling in here. There they are. Okay, so uh, I want to hear some people tell me about your experience of, of talking about this. I just will share this with you. Larry Richard said this. A value is something important enough to, to find consistent expression in the choices that you make. So that means that column one and column two should be pretty similar. Because if they're similar, it means that these things that you say are your values, they're actually being lived out in your lives as a church, right? If they're not, if they're on one side and then on the other side they're totally opposite, we got some issues, right? So... So let, tell me about your experience. Uh, give me one group here. This group was done first. Tell me what you guys discovered. Okay, well, we basically said that you need your core, which is the church itself first. So if you're not meeting, you're not doing anything. So we put weekend worship gathering and technical teaching up top because you need those in order to have anything else. Giving and volunteerism um, are the next step down, three and four, because those are your tools which are to accomplish everything else in the list. The children and the youth are the future of the church, so they're uh, also in the core. After that, you get outside the church. In order to have disciples, you need to evangelize. So we put evangelism. So you evangelize, get disciples. You teach your disciples spiritual gifts, and by teaching that, you build the community. Once you have a strong community, you outreach globally. 
the whole, growing the church is incidental if you're doing all this, the church is going to grow by itself. You don't need to focus on that. It'll take care of itself. Same for compassion and justice. That's something that's incidental to everything else in the world. Whoa. This guy's like a PhD professor up here. I love this guy. All right, so, so um, does anyone in the room want to challenge uh, any of his conclusions or maybe give a, another perspective? Did, did you all come up with the same answer? Okay, so tell me, tell me what you had differently. Sir, tell me what your group had differently. Really? Now, can I ask you a question? Uh, you said the children are the future of the church. Correct. Interesting. Um, so does that mean, in your perspective, the only way to grow this church is through having more children come in and pour into that? Huh, okay, good. Interesting, interesting. All right, all right. Uh, someone else want to give this their uh, list, maybe a little different, yeah, right here. Oh, boy. Uh, Cheating. Got to be in there first. Okay. All right. I love this. I love this. Someone else? Want to give us their, uh, their thing here? Pastor Matt? Acts 2. Okay. Similar ideas as theirs. Okay. So you guys agree. He got the answers right is what you're trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. I know, I know, I know. I'm joking with you. I'm joking with you. Yeah, so, okay, so now tell me what you discovered as you began to look at column two and the amount of time spent versus what you think it should be. Is there anything that's really out of line in your list? Any group that had something that was like, wow, this is, we're really out of line here. We got, we think this is really high in priority, but we're not really spending much time on it. Anything like that happen in anyone's group? Pastor Matt's group happened. What did you find there? Well, I just think the whole discipleship and evangelism thing, just in my perspective, it happens, but it's, it's rarely compared to other things. Yeah. Rarely, yeah, it, comes, it falls way down the list, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what happens is, is that we think discipleship and evangelism, a lot of us would probably put it in, I don't know, I didn't hear it in the top six in some of these, but I'm sure some people put it in the top six or seven. Huh? Second. Then, it, yeah, it dropped off quite a bit in terms of how we practice it. So we say, we say out loud, and we believe in our hearts, and we even read in the Bible, discipleship and evangelism is a really important thing, but the way we live church life out doesn't really indicate that we necessarily believe it's that important. We get caught, we get caught up in other stuff that distracts us from those things. Make sense? 
Yeah. Awesome. Right. Yep. Yeah, so, so what's interesting is a lot of churches have visions and vision statements, and they reflect the values of that church, right? I'm sure this church has a vision statement. I don't know it, but I'm sure some of you could rattle it off. The question is, are you unified around the vision statement? Are you unified around what you believe Jesus is calling this church to be and do, Right? And, and then the question becomes, how will you actually make consistent choices to live out these values that you think are really important, right? So obviously, you come here every week, church goes on, we make a space for church biblical teaching worship to happen. So it's a huge importance to most churches. But where's the space in our lives for coming together as smaller groups and building into each other and learning this, this discipleship evangelism thing, this making disciples, where does that space cut out? See, so we give tons of hours to this. So the church I lead in Wheaton, we decided that one Sunday of the month we would not meet for this. We would instead serve the world that one Sunday. So on Sunday morning, the second Sunday of every month, my church is out of their seats, offering themselves as a living sacrifice. That's their spiritual act of worship. Instead of going to church, we go and be the church. Instead of hearing a sermon, we give the sermon. Okay? Radically crazy idea. And we had to teach our people that just because you're not sitting in a pew on Sunday, you still give your offering to the church. And it worked. And we served tons of people and built tons of relationships in the community because of that. Right? That was a value choice we made to say we've got to block out these two hours because people tell us we're too busy, we can't do this. We, when we block out all kinds of time to worship, let's block out some time to do these other things. Right? Okay? So, now, look at this chart. This is the attendance uh, of uh, decline going on in the American church. Okay, it's down into the right. Any business that would be in this situation would be in trouble pretty rapidly. But Barna came out with a report this week, and this is what it said. They asked people, if you were invited to church by a personal friend, would you go? And 53% of the people in our culture said no, they wouldn't go, even if invited by a personal friend. That just came out this week. I just read that on Tuesday afternoon, a new Barna book coming out. This is what they found. They're asking people on church people stuff. So the question is, here's the thing. Every church in America is trying to find a formula to reverse this trend. Because none of us like this idea. We, we think church is important. We want more people to come and be part of it because we know how much of a blessing it's been in our lives. The problem is, is that this continues. And young people are even less enamored with church. They're walking away faster than anybody. They're saying, you know what, church, whatever. It doesn't mean a whole lot to me. Right? So we've got to find a, a, a formula. Now, our main formula has been to invite people to church so we've said, you know, let's invite people to our churches. But again, that's not working anymore. And in fact, look at this chart. That big blue thing there, that's 73% of the people in our culture have never been invited to church by anybody. 23% that were invited said, no, thank you, not coming. And only 4% accepted the invitation to church. So again, we've got these strategies we're pursuing, but they're not necessarily um, working especially in a modern-day world that's changing. Our culture is different now, right? So, so this becomes a huge discussion because, you know, think about it again. Think about that definition. What you value is what you spend your time on. It finds consistent expression in the choices you make as a people. So this church needs to decide, okay, what's our values and how we're going to block out time for those things that we think are going to really change this picture, right? Now, have you heard of this company? Yeah, so what, what were they known for? Film. In 1994, they owned 89% of the film market in America. In that same year, they had, a digi they had an engineer sitting at his desk. His name is Steve Sasson. He invented at his desk the digital camera. And he brought it to his superiors, 
and said, look what I've got. This is the next wave of photography. You know what they said? What? What are you doing, Steve? We got, you see what's going on here? We got 89% of the film market, man. Just take that cute little invention back to your desk and just, you know, keep it to yourself. In January 2012, Kodak Company filed for bankruptcy. They're now a digital imaging business corporation, reorganized. This is a parable, folks. And when we talk about changing church, people freak out, don't they? Christians freak out. Because we always go, really? You want me to change? You want me to do something different? Oh, man, our church is this way. This is the way we do it. So, you, know, you, know, you mean you got some new digital thing to do? I can't do that. Go back to your desk. Pastor, what are you talking about? Get out of my face. No, no, guys. If we don't alter what we're doing, we are going to lose the war. Right? Okay, now, we all know Jesus wins, right? So I don't want to be too, too doom and gloom on this. Jesus wins. He's going to win. His church will sustain because Jesus will sustain his church. But the way we're doing church may not be sustainable if we don't do some different things. Okay? Find some different ways to move. Make sense? Okay, now, when I say different ways to move, oh, here is an interesting quote. This is a guy, uh, I met with his pastor in Gurney, Illinois, is what he said. If we keep doing what we're doing, we'll be presiding over the largest decline of the church and its influence in American history. Now, this is just a pastor. This is just a regular guy, like Matt and me, just, just a guy running his church. And this is what he's come to. This is the conclusion he's come to. We've got to do something different, okay? Now, when we say different, a lot of us think of, you know, uh, man, different feels weird. And you're right, it does. Um, I, I uh, had a girl in my church who was from Australia, and she came to me one summer and said, hey, I'm getting married next summer to my Australian fiancé, and I would love you to do our wedding. And I said, really, where's your wedding going to be? And she said, Australia. I said, how are we going to get there? She said, well, my dad's going to fly you over and your wife. I'm like, okay, we're in. <laughs> I, I prayed really quickly. Thank you, Lord, for this gift of uh, this trip to Australia. So it happened to correspond with our 25th wedding anniversary, and we went, and the first thing that we had happened to us was that we were suddenly in, in, in a changed situation because we came out of the airport, and the cars, instead of going this way, were going this way. And when I got to my rental car, I went around the driver's side to get in. There was no steering wheel because it was on the other side of the car. So I had to get in the passenger side of the car, for me, drive the car on the left side of the road, which means a right turn was a left turn, and a left turn was a right turn, which was immediately troublesome. And we almost died several times as I turned right into oncoming traffic multiple times in the first week. Because when you do something different, it feels weird. And it takes some adjustment. It took me a week to figure out how to drive on the left without thinking. It took me a while to get on to this. The same thing's true in your Christian faith in the church, right? When you do something a little different, it feels weird at first. It doesn't mean it's wrong. I, you know, my first thing was to say, these Australian people are screwed up here. You know, they don't know how to drive. <laughs> they, don't they know cars are supposed to go on the right side of the road? Well, I mean, they think I'm nuts because they're like, no, cars go on the left side of the road. It's all your perspective. So when we think about church and our own Christian faith and how we live it out, sure it's going to feel weird to move differently. But guess what? The end of the road of moving differently is a great reward. You know, I could have gone to Australia and said, oh, I'm just not going to be able to drive a car. We guys will just sit in this one city and we won't see the place. Instead, we toured the Great Ocean Road and drove all over the country. It was amazing. Just because we learned to drive on the left. Right? Now, when I say something new, often you think, Something really new, like we got to get neon lights going, we got to get something going. I, I don't think that's it. So here's Jeremiah, he says this. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is, and walk in it. You'll find rest for your souls. I love this verse. Uh, I learned about the ancient paths a few years ago when I was taking kids to Colorado camp. I, I take, I've taken kids for, I've gone to Colorado Challenge Camp for 30 years. It's in Woodland Park, Colorado. We just bring high school kids out there, and we, we kind of turn them on to Jesus. It's, what, it's basically the purpose of the camp. I've seen more kids come to know Jesus in that camp than any place else in my ministry. So I go there and speak now, and kids come. Now, years ago, I'd bring kids with me, and I, I did it so many times. I knew the road. I knew you went Interstate 25 down the Colorado Springs, caught 24 up into the mountains, up to Woodland Park. I even knew the exits and how long it took to go from one exit to the next. And, you know, so I knew if I stopped at the Boston Market in Monument, Colorado, it was one hour to the camp from there. Very simple, right? So we're sitting there one day with 40 high school kids, three vans, uh, you know, all of us youth sponsors. And this lady walks up to me, this little old lady. She says, where are you guys going? I said, Woodland Park, Colorado, Quaker Ridge Camp. It's going to be awesome. 
She says, how are you going to get there? I'm like, man, there's a six-lane highway out front. It goes 75 miles an hour into Colorado Springs and up 24. It's the only way to get to Willem Park. It's the best way. She goes, Sonny, that's not the best way to get to Willem Park. I go, what are you talking about? It's the only way I know. She says, come with me, Sonny. Takes me out behind the restaurant. She points at the mountain, which has got a dirt road running up the side of it. She goes, that's the best way to go to Woodland Park. I go, man, we don't have like eight hours to do this. Like, we got to get there. She goes, if you go that way, it's exactly one hour to the minute from here to the gas station in Woodland Park. She says, that's the ancient road. It's way better than the new road. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, thank you very much. And uh, my wife says, we're doing this. <laughs> so the next day I know, I'm driving three vans full of kids, uh, other vehicles carrying our stuff up this dirt road, up this side of this mountain at 15 miles per hour, creeping up on this ancient road. But here's what happened. We started to get to the top. We started to see this valley open up that we'd never noticed before, going 75. All of a sudden, we saw rock formations. We saw cliffs. We saw deer. We saw wildlife. It was amazing. It was the best drive into Colorado ever on the ancient road. And we got to that gas station one hour to the minute. Seriously, it was unbelievable. So Jeremiah says, look for the ancient path. So we think that new means going to some newfangled thing. No, it just means returning. It's a return to the pathway, the ancient pathway. It's a returning to something that's tried and true, a church that Jesus might go to. That's what I think it is, okay? So now I, I think I have another assignment for you now. Are you ready? In your groups. Um, we're going to talk about these. What are the roots of the church? And some of you already cheated and looked ahead, looked ahead a little bit, but, um, you know, in your groups, get back in those groups, and I want you to explore these things because these are the roots of a church, the practices, the patterns, the behaviors, and beliefs. And I want you to, to write down a list on your sheet there with your group of the patterns, practices, beliefs, and behaviors of this ancient church, this ancient way, okay? I'll give you uh, 10 minutes to do this. Get in your groups. Go. So what'd you find? Tell me, uh, give me some of the, the patterns, practices, behaviors, beliefs of this ancient pathway, this ancient church. Are we missing a group still? I feel like, feel like we're missing these people right here, maybe. I don't know. Oh, you're over there. Okay, cool. All right. All right. Suddenly I'm just like, uh, I don't know, somebody, met, yeah, all right. So give me some, give me one, give me one, one, one thing you discovered about this ancient church. Yeah. Yeah, they were a community. That's good, I love that. Yeah, they were tightly knit together and all things in common. Excellent. What else? Yeah. They ate together, which we just did, which is cool. We had Jet's Pizza. They probably didn't have that, but it's okay. All right, what else? Yeah. Good, yeah, they were, they were authentic with each other. There wasn't any hiding, pretending going on. What else? Yeah. Yeah. So when you have a, a strong enemy outside the walls pressing on you, suddenly you band together pretty quickly, don't you? You forget about silly little theological arguments and whatever else, and you start to go, you know what? This is life or death. We better get in this thing together. Right? We don't have time to talk about whether this person should do that or whatever. We just got to get together. Okay, what else? Yeah, this is a life. It's a lifestyle for them, right? Yeah, what else? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of American culture fights against biblical values. We like to think of ourselves as a Christian nation, but the reality is a lot of our culture and our cultural values do not match at all what we need to do to be the biblical community of Jesus. I don't know if you're getting that, but this morning it should be pretty evident, both the sermon and this. There's differences here, right? So we've got to fight. Again, we've got to walk differently 
maybe uncomfortably as Americans to be following Jesus. It's kind of strange, right? Yeah, what else? What else did you get? Yeah, Matt. Uh, yeah, this was devotions. I love to think of those almost like disciplines. These were disciplines, right? They were intentional about those four things. We're doing them, yeah. <laughs> you're just saying. You're just saying. All right. That's good. That's good. Yeah, right here. Yeah. They, had, they were generous and had plenty for themselves. Yeah, they just gave away their stuff. Yeah. They obeyed God rather than man. Now, when you start to look at this ancient way, it starts to probably hit you between the eyes a little bit. It hits me between the eyes like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I've left the ancient path. I'm on the fast track. I'm on the 75-mile-an-hour highway going 75 miles an hour, and I've left half this stuff behind just to get to some destination. I'm not really sure where I'm going, right? We want to be followers of Jesus, right? Now, I, I've thought a lot about this, and I want to give you a little picture now um, that I think is important to get about what discipleship might look like when we talk about people. So I need uh, Pastor Matt, Pastor Jason. Where do you go? Yeah, you got to be kidding me. I need, I need that man right there, and I need uh, one other person to help me out here. Vern, yeah, Vern, come on up. We'll go up here on top where we can see this, and uh, we'll do this. So I just want to help you understand how this discipleship thing, it, it's pretty complicated. And I, I thought about this a little bit, see if I can get myself to understand how this might work, okay? So uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, you can be the body. What's your name again? Nate. Nate. I knew that. I just met you at lunch, but all right. Nate's the body. You know what the body's all about, right? It's the flesh. It's the body. It often gets a bad rap because the scripture talks about the flesh hosting all this terrible stuff and sin. And, but, you know, the body was made by God in the book of Genesis, created good, right, and pronounced good. And so, you know, our bodies are good, and we're supposed to take care of them and all that. And it's the part of people that you see the most, right? You, can, you see people acting out with their bodies, and you understand who they are by what they do and how they look and it's a big deal, right? Uh, Vern is going to be the soul. And the soul, I think, is the part of us that kind of houses our, our personalities, um, our, our, our willpower, um, our ethics and morals in the, in the soul. I think each person's got a unique soul probably, right? It kind of li lives out in different ways, you know? And, and so when the Bible talks about the soul, I think we're talking about that kind of stuff. Now, deeper inside of us, is a place that is the spirit. And if we could get these to really look right, we'd have Matt's head coming out of Vern's chest and Vern's chest head coming out of, because they, you know, they'd be inside of uh, Nate over there, right? And, but we can't do that. So the spirit is the place that deeply connects with God and is a special thing given to humans made in the image of God to make this connection with this creator in a way that no other creature in the face of the earth can do it. Make sense? Now, We've got to add to this illustration because here's the thing. Hebrews didn't think like the Greeks. Hebrews actually thought of man as one. So what they said was whatever happens to the body happens to the soul and the spirit. So we've got to put this on, right? And we're going to go uh, link these, two, these three together. So Vern's going to be in the middle here. We'll just loop him up here. Sorry, Vern. And then uh, Pastor Matt will just, it's good that, you know, I get to touch you guys a little bit. It's always exciting. So, all right. So, um, we'll tie these guys up. And now it comes Jason. Here comes Jason now. <laughs> We're just looking for you. They said you left for crying out loud. I don't know. So, all right. So, now look. So, think about discipleship. So, you got these three areas going on in your life, right? And we know that, that uh, sin enters into this. Now, here's what happens. For a long time, if you think about it, people that live outside of Jesus, this is what they look like. Let me show you. You're going you're to die. You're going to die on your own. Just die on your own. Just die. Yeah, there we go. Okay, the spirit is dead in them. The spirit's dead. Sin has killed the spirit. They cannot relate to God. The body and the soul run the show, and they drag the dead spirit along with them wherever they go. And they make choices 
out of what they only have, which is their soul and their body. True? Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you must be born again. So God breathes on the, this spirit, the breath of life, again for a second time, and through Jesus Christ, the spirit's made alive again. Now we have a Christian. Now here's the problem, folks. You become a Christian, but the problem is the body and the soul are not used to listening to the spirit. Would you agree? So Jesus is planted in here. And let's just say this is a male, and I'm a supermodel. Just pretend. So here I come down the, down the road, you know, shaking my supermodel stuff around. And uh, what's going to happen? If you're a male, Nate, what's going to happen? I'm obviously a supermodel as well. Well, you are. <laughs> we can see that. We can see that. <laughs> but if, if you're the male and I come along with my supermodel stuff shaking, what's going to happen? I'm probably going to follow. You're going to follow and you're going to drag the soul. And this spirit is going to be going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But he's a little tiny spirit because we haven't really developed him. He's just kind of in our life a little bit. And so what happens? The body and soul, they win. And they drag us into the wrong thing all the time, right? The Spirit gets dragged along. What's it say in the Scripture? It says, live by the Spirit, and you will overcome the misdeeds of the body. You will change your perspective. So our job as Christians, our sanctification, our discipleship, is to grow the Spirit's influence in our lives so that we reverse the flow of who's in charge. We no longer want to live by the sinful nature. We want to live by the spirit. We want to put to death the misdeeds of the body. And we want to come to life in us, the life of Jesus. Make sense? Yeah, we're pleading to beat our bodies to keep it under control. That's exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. That's right. So, so it's amazing because if I do this, when I do this really right, I, I would have had a really tiny kid up here being the spirit. And then I would have brought up a big dude to grow the life of the Spirit, to show how it changes the game, right? And look what happens. Let's say the body and soul pull in opposite directions, or the body and spirit pull in opposite directions. What happens to the soul? Yeah, you get squeezed. You're getting kind of pain there. So a lot of people live in emotional turmoil because their body's going one way and the Spirit's trying to go another way. And since we don't make choices consistently to go the right way, we just get squeezed and we feel miserable. Does this sound familiar? This sounds familiar to me. I don't know. So... So now, th so this is good. So this is a good picture of mine, right? Okay, now we've got to untie you guys. Can you get yourself untied there? I try to make it loose. You know, there we go. We just, we just drop it on the floor. Just drop it all on the floor and we'll just get it later. We'll clean it up later so as to preserve, preserve time. So, so now we go back to this question of, so what does it look like to live this ancient way? And I know your pastor, staff, your pastor and staff has been talking to you about this idea of a triad or a quad getting with a group of people, and actually working out this, you know, life of Jesus. Why do we need such a thing like that? Well, I just gave you the illustration as to why, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through this now. Let's try to go through this, some of this a little quicker. Three reasons you need to try it, okay? Three reasons you need to try it. And I just put try it up there because I didn't want to write try it quite every time. But we understand that I'm talking about try it. I'm talking about either three or four people that would come together, right, and, and connect Okay, so reason number one, um, we're created for connection. We're created for connection. We've already seen the early church. They lived together, deeply connected to each other. How does that help deal with the thing we just saw on stage? If we're deeply connected to each other, what happens? Start to brainstorm with me here. Help me out. Okay, you're accountable. Yeah. When you're feeling lousy because your soul is in turmoil because your body just went one way and your spirit just went the other way, you got somebody to talk to about it, right? It's a pretty big deal, okay? What's that? Yeah, yeah, more unified, right? We're together. So, so now, I, we, we won't go through some of this stuff. These are just verses. I just want to show you that God himself is a God who lives in connection. So these are verses about Jesus and God being one and the Holy Spirit and the Father being one. Um, and there's really some pretty profound Greek words around this, right? It's amazing how the Holy Spirit is described in a way that he's the same substance exactly as Jesus. So like the Greek word that says this is, uh, if, I had a, if I had a pew Bible like, or a hymnal like this one, and I wanted to give you one that was in the same way the Holy Spirit and God are connected, I'd have to give you one exactly the same with all the same markings 
everything in this, bio, in this book. It had to be exactly the same. That's how connected Jesus and God are. So now I take you to this place and say, well, how are we made? We're made in his image, right? So therefore, we are made for connection, deep connection with people, right? It's the way we're made. It's the way we're supposed to function. Tell me about American culture. Do we function this way? No. No, we pretty much walk alone. Um, in fact, one of the most profound things of, of doing a neighborhood group of guys in my neighborhood is finding out how many of them feel like there's nowhere to go to talk about their life issues. So a lot of people are dealing with all this stuff we just talked about on stage with that picture, and there's nowhere for them to go and talk about it with anybody. There's nowhere to go and be authentic. There's nowhere to go and talk about, man, I'm really struggling with this, or I'm really struggling with that. We just walk along. Right? Jesus thought this was so important, he actually prayed about it. The only prayer recorded of Jesus is John 17. Not probably the only prayer, but his largest prayer, right? He says, I'll remain, in the, I'll remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Okay? My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me. That's us. Through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So our job is to become one. Again, we think this is going to happen by, like, osmosis. If you sit in these pews every Sunday morning, you will not become one. I mean, you'll have a great experience of worship together, and that will be binding you together, but you won't become connected. Connection is crucial, right? So let's, let's, let's illustrate this for you, okay? So here's the exercise I have for you. I want you to find someone in this room in the next minute that you don't typically know or talk to. So somebody here who you don't talk to typically, maybe you know their name, maybe you've seen them across the worship center before, and I want you to spend six minutes finding someone, something, or someplace in common with them. These questions can serve as your guide to get you started. Make sense? You can use other questions if they come to your mind, but I want you to find someone, something, or someplace in common with a person that you don't know right now. Okay? Ready, set, go. Go find somebody you don't know. Don't cheat. And talk to somebody you've never talked to before. Okay. Bring it back up here to the front. Come back to your seats. I want to hear about what you discovered. I want to hear about what you discovered. Some people are still going. They can't stop themselves. See, they get going on this connection stuff. Next thing you know, you've lost them. It's awesome. All right, um, so who got a connection in the first question? Anyone here got a, okay, right back here. Tell me about it. You. Both swimmers. He what? He's from England and swam there, and you swam in Lake St. Clair or whatever. <laughs> okay, Iowa, okay, sweet. But now, when you found out you're both swimmers, what happened? Any, any, anything happened inside of you when you found out you're both swimmers? Yeah, because you understand what swimming takes and what it's about. And so you guys ha have a new connection formed around swimming. You probably feel a little differently about each other now than you did six minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else, what other connections we form? Right here. First thing in common, your name is her son's name and boy's name. So, right there, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that is. Yeah, that led to more discussion. Yeah, see, it's cool. What else? Yeah. Yeah, 
which is awesome. What else? Yeah. I, I saw you guys all of a sudden kind of be like, oh, oh uh, mine too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you were excited all of a sudden. I, I could see you light up right toward the end after I said like 30 seconds. All of a sudden I'm like, oh, there they go. They just, they, they just figured it out. So, so what happens inside you when you find these connections with people? What happens inside you? It's exciting. There's endorphins involved. Something happens. It's like, wow, this is cool. My soul is actually singing. Because I just found a person, and you know I've done this exercise in a ton of churches. I've had people hugging each other after six minutes. Because they both found out their middle children, or they both found out. One lady in one church, she's talking to a guy that she's gone to church with her whole stinking life. And finds out that he knows, he knew her mother that had died. And she, he knew things about her mom that she never knew. And he's telling her this in my workshop in six minutes. And she's weeping, telling us the story. This other workshop I was in, these two people start talking. This woman wants to get into hospice care. The other woman she ends up talking to is in hospice care. And they start talking about this, and they mean a connection, form friendship. So we think forming connections is so difficult for us, right? It takes so much time. We're so busy. we got no time for this connection stuff. <sighs> six minutes. Do you have six minutes? Maybe on Sunday morning you should have six minutes, put these questions up, and say, I want everyone to find someone, something, or some place in common. Go talk to somebody you've never met before. Forget the greeting time, which is usually just running around going, hey, 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 how's it going? Yeah. Right? Do something like this. Start forming connections right in your church. This is the beginning of forming triads. Finding people that you can be connected with, right? Just natural connections. You don't have to get in a triad. You know, we're not going to try to assign you with a triad that you have no one, in, nothing, you know, with someone that you don't have nothing in common with. Get with triads of people that already are like, kind of feel like a connection. This is what we're created for. That's why it feels good, right? So that's the first reason you need to try it, okay? Second one, I'll, I'll give you this quote. This is a great quote. Larry Crabb, you know who he is? The future of the church depends on whether it develops true community. We can get by for a while on size, skill of communication, and programs to meet every need. But unless we sense that we belong to each other with masks off, the vibrant church of today will become the powerless church of tomorrow. Stale, irrelevant, a place of pretense where sufferers suffer alone, where pressure generates conformity rather than the spirit creating life. That's where the church is headed unless it focuses on community. Now, guys, we're talking about an, an ancient road that feels really different for us Americans because we're used to just living our lives on our own and having very shallow connections. You want to change the world? You want to change your church? You want to change your life? You want to get the Spirit of God growing in your life? Start connecting with people here in a deep way. Demonstrate for the world something totally supernatural and different. And you'll start to change the world. It's amazing. Now, second reason you need to try it is you were built to belong. Okay? Built to belong. Romans chapter 12. You know this verse? For just as each one of us uh, has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. You can walk in a room full of people like this and feel like you are not at all belonging to this place. True? You can sit and listen to the best sermon in the world every week, hear the best worship music ever, worship God, and feel completely disconnected from the group of people that are there. Okay? That cannot happen. That is not church in the ancient way. That is church in the modern way, not church in the ancient way. The ancient church, the people belonged to each other. They were deeply connected and belonged to each other, okay? Um, now, people belong in these spaces right here, these four spaces. Public space is like you all go to the Lions. Let's say we all went to the Lions game. I'd be miserable, but all oh, you'd be okay, right? So, um, we all, all go to the Lions game. What's going to happen? The Lions score a touchdown, and you're going to be in, in this public space with all these people, and your immediate connection with them is going to be you, you all love the Lions, and you're pumped they scored a touchdown. And you're going to be high-fiving people you never met, jumping around going, whoa, whoa, going psycho with people you've never met, right? Because you all are pumped about this one common thing, the Lions, right? We all belong in these spaces, public spaces. It might be work where you go to work, and you're all pumped about the same thing you're working at. Okay? Great. Second space you belong in is, is a social space. It's like 
It's like a space where you go, maybe it's a, a neighborhood party you go to or a, a work party, and you're all hanging out, you know, you're having some drinks, you're just kind of having some shallow conversation, whatever, right? Those spaces are good. It's good. You know, we, have, we need those. They're, they're excellent. I love those social spaces. Now, the two spaces that we struggle to belong in are these next two. Personal space. Personal space means you belong with people in a way that they know part of who you are. They know your story. They know what's going on inside you. They, they know what's going on in your soul. They know what you're struggling with in terms of this whole walking out this Christian faith thing. They, they are across the table from you, and they can ask you questions about your life because they know things about you that other people don't know in social and public space. And, you know, no one's going to turn you at the Lions game and go, so uh, are you struggling with any sin this week, sir, while we're slapping five? That's going to happen, right? In fact, is all I know about him is he's a Lions fan. He's like, oh, boy, that's a terrible question. It is a terrible question. But, you know, either way, you know. Um, so, so, so these, two, these last two spaces are crucial for us to exist in it. And now social scientists say that if we don't exist in all four spaces, we're not healthy. Okay, again, most Americans, we exist in the top two, and we have very few places where we have personal intimate space. Obviously, marriage is an intimate space, but even some marriages now, people walk by each other. I go in restaurants and sit and watch couples, and they sit across the table from each other, and they, they look down at their phones the whole time. They don't even talk to each other. So we're just becoming like, even an intimate space, right? It's like, holy cow. Now, you have a question. That's good. That's good. Yeah, there's, so, so the body, soul, spirit picture, right? There's all this stuff going on under the surface, but we can pick and choose which parts of our soul we want to reveal to people. So you have to be in this deep connection and deep belonging with people for you to really want to reveal your real junk. You have to know and trust that you're loved, right? You're probably not going to reveal a lot of junk to the person you just met six minutes ago. So why do you need a triad? Why do you need a quad? So you can be with people on a regular basis, belonging to each other in a way that reveals and helps you unpack your personal stuff. Building trusting relationships where you can start to figure out how to grow the influence of the Spirit in your lives and how to de-influence the sinful nature, how to work through that together. You need people to pray for you when you can't defeat the misdeeds of the body and you need someone to stand over you and pray for you. You know, Jesus said this brilliant thing, Matthew 18, 20. He said, when two or three people gather in my name, I'm in the middle of them. In fact, that passage is all about bringing someone to the church who can't get their sin done. I don't think it means bringing them in front of a church like this in front of 500 people and saying, here you go, this, this bum can't get it right. I think it means bringing them to his quad or triad and saying, hey, this guy, he's messing up. And the quad or triad deals with that person. It's a lot better way to go. So here's another quote for you. Randy Frazzi, uh, the development of meaningful relationships where every member carries a significant sense of belonging is central to what it means to be the church. This is a God-ordained gathering of people that is so strong that even the gates of hell will not overcome it. Okay? So why do you need a triad? Well, because you're created for connection, and you're built to belong. And these are the key things, right? And there's one last reason, and that's your design. Uh, yeah, design for discipleship. Design for discipleship. I don't know this PowerPoint well yet, because I just made it. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, and uh, discipleship's got several aspects to it, and I want to just run through a few of these with you. The first one is imitation. Now, have you ever seen that car commercial on TV? It was, it's been out like a year ago where the, where the dad's throwing the ball with the son. First, you only see the son, and he's kind of like, you know, like this with the ball. And then all of a sudden, the camera pans out, and you see the dad throwing. It's like, oh, my goodness. That kid has got no chance of being a baseball player, right? Because he's imitating his dad who's throwing the ball wrong. I, I've been on golf courses watching dads try to teach their kids how to swing a golf club. I'm just like, oh, my goodness. That kid has no chance. No chance. Because he's imitating the wrong person, right? Imitation is crucial. Uh, it's in the scripture that we're supposed to, Paul says to the Corinthians, therefore I urge you to imitate me. Philippians, he said, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So here's what happens in a triad. You get to have some models of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Sitting right next to you in the seats. 
And you get to say, I'm going to imitate this in this person. You ever been in those groups where you're like, man, I wish I could get this like he gets it. I've been in those people, man. They just like, uh, man, I wish I could... I wish I could take care of my money like this guy takes care of his money. Right? I, wish I, could, I wish I could treat my wife like this guy treats his wife. I wish I could raise my kids like this guy raises his kids. I wish I could read my Bible like he reads his Bible. Ever been in those groups? Yeah. That's what a triad does. You, you get pulled along by people that are like an example, and you follow their example. You know, this, this recently happened for my son Joseph. I made him dro- join the cross-country team as an eighth grader because he's like, he tends to be a little uh, hefty at times. So he's a baseball player. This is his real sport. But last w- summer, I noticed his speed dropping off and everything else because he was just getting heftier. He's just built like a tank. He can hit the ball a mile. And he, you know, he's a good athlete, but he's just built like a tank. So I said, Joe, you got to do something on a regular basis. So he joined cross country, and he's lost seven pounds. It's awesome. And the, the last race, I told him, look, Joe, I think you got more in your tank, man. I want you to follow Finn. Stay with him. He's your model. Imitate him. Whatever Finn does, you do it. He followed Finn. He finished 35 seconds faster in a two-mile time following his buddy. Whoa. Just imagine if we started doing this for each other spiritually. Right? Coming together and imitating each other. Okay? Could be cool. All right, here's, here's another one. Imitators of us and of the Lord. The second one is reproduction. Right? Reproduction. Design for discipleship. Part of discipleship is reproducing ourselves. If we never reproduce ourselves, then we're not really going. I no longer call you servants because the servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I learned from my father I made known to you. So reproduction. We're supposed to reproduce ourselves in other people. How do you do that? When you're in relationship with them. Right? When you're hanging out together around these things. Okay? All right. Uh, Here's Paul. He comes and gets Timothy. He reproduces himself in Timothy. Right? Makes himself, uh, makes Timothy like him. A, a, a third thing is sharpening. Part of discipleship is sharpening. This is accountability. Um, here's the verse, right? As iron, as iron sharpens iron, one person sharpens another. So, you know, the great thing is when you're in a group of people, you're going to get sharper. You're going to get sharpened because they're going to rub off on you. And hopefully you're going to hold each other accountable to different ways to do life. Right? Um, another one is intentional growth. Now, this is a big one for me. Um, in the church, again, this goes back to what I said in my sermon, we are great at giving people classes. So we give a class like this, and we think, okay, this is great. You know, people are really getting some new stuff. But here's the thing. Here's what I've learned. This won't change people's behavior. This will motivate you for a time. This will change your perspective for a time. But if you don't leave here and take a step of action, nothing will change. Within two weeks, you'll be living the same way you did before you came to this workshop for two hours. And you'll have wasted your time and mine. So the intentional growth piece becomes, what are you going to do when you walk out of here today that's going to change the way you live your life? And obviously our goal today would be to say, what are you going to do toward forming a triad or a quad, getting with two or three other people, and becoming intentional to walk this stuff out? Make sense? So that's going to be my battle cry at the end. What will you do to make this happen? So you're not just going to another class, getting some more knowledge, and then going on with your life and nothing changes. I'm reading this book called, it's called Influencer by the guy named Joseph Crenny, social scientist. Brilliant book. And the guy is talking about behavior change and how difficult it is. It's unbelievable, and it's, he's right. And in the church for so long, so like we, when we wrote the Arts of Spiritual Conversation that you've gone through, again, Great to have a sermon series on those. They won't get ingrained in your congregation, become part of the DNA of your congregation, unless you practice them with other people. So the reason we love to have triads in our ministry, because we want the triads to come together. We want them to study noticing, go practice it, come back and talk about how it went. Then we want them to study praying, go practice it, come back and talk about how it went. And keep doing that. Because it's the only way we'll actually change and become different people. Make sense? intentional growth, intentional choices to change, to do something different. And again, that's, it's doing something. It's training. Think about it. If you were only to go to driver's ed classroom, how well would you drive? Disaster. <laughs> you got to get behind the wheel. But so much in the church, we don't get behind the wheel ever. 
We hear another sermon, get another teaching, and then we just go on with our lives. So what will you do today when you're leaving here to really get behind the wheel in this? Make sense? Okay. Uh, so there, there's, you know, that's the intentional thing there. You know, we're supposed to all be reaching the maturity, the whole measure, the fullness of Christ. I and mean, this is, a, you know, you get this. You've, you've read this verse, right? That's what we're supposed to be attaining together. And then the last part uh, is this. What happens in your triad? So, like, if you were to form a triad, what would you do in there? How could you be in a triad together? And, and I know you're getting tired, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting toward the end. I'm going to give you one more little exercise to do, though, before we leave, okay? Because I want you to practice something before we leave, okay? So I'm just going to give you one more little exercise. But I'm going to walk you through these possible things you could do when you try it. Okay, you with me? You still with me? I can see, I can see that it was starting to droop a little, which I get. I understand. So, all right. All right, so we don't want this to be painful. The first thing you can do in your triad is to introduce each other to Jesus. You go, what? What? Hey, did you, I don't know if you know this, this passage, but do you know that Peter and John and Andrew and those guys were all disciples of John the Baptist first? It's right here. And do you know that when Andrew met Jesus, he went over and got his brother and said, hey, you got to come check out this Jesus guy? So the great thing is, is that, you know, when you're in a triad together, you can help each other understand this Jesus more fully so that you can be with him more fully, right? Walk with him more fully. Um, so that's the first thing you do in a triad. How do you, how do you, how do you think you'd go about um, helping each other, introducing each other to Jesus in your, in your group of three or four? How, how might you do that? Give me some ideas. Awesome. You, you just tell them your story about how Jesus, what Jesus means to you. Awesome. What else could you do? Yeah. What's that? Show unconditional love to him, yeah. What else could you do to introduce him to Jesus, that your triad members? You could read Bible together. You could pray together, right? You could do these things, right? So, consistency, getting together with him, right? Being consistent, being there for him. That's good. That's excellent. Yeah, I like it. That's great, Okay. So, second thing, we already heard this, share your stories. Where in your life do you tell your whole story? The unedited version of your story. We tell the edited version of our stories a lot. And usually, we wrap them up with, and now, it's all great. Two years ago, I was going through this, but now, my life is just Jesus all the time. Woo! Really? Come on, people. We're all struggling all the time. We're unfinished. Let's just tell the unfinished version of the story. You know, if you're sitting across from people that you know every week, you can't bull crap them. They're gonna have to, you have to tell them what's really up. They're going to tell you, hey, what are you, what are you giving me a bunch of stuff? You know, Gordon, what are you doing? Is that Gordon? That's not the right name. It's close. Roland, I knew that. All right, sorry, Roland. All right. So, so, you know, you, you start, to, so, so this is what you do. You share each other's stories. You talk. Can you imagine getting together with your triad? The first thing you do is, okay, uh, this week, Matt's going to tell his story. We're all going to ask him questions. The next time we get together, the, I'm going to tell my story. We're all going to ask me questions. The next time we get together, you know, Don's going to tell his story, and we're all going to ask questions about him. Now we've all gotten to know each other in a whole new way. We've heard each other's stories. We've unpacked them. It's awesome. Okay? Um, I love this. Uh, this is the one where Jesus tells the guy, go tell everybody what the Lord's done for you. Right? Go do it. Go tell them. This is all we've got to do. Get in our triads. Tell, tell people what the Lord's done for us. Okay? Here's, here's the one. Hear, God, hear God's word in your triad. Hear God's word. Now, this is where I want to do a little exercise with you. Okay? So what, I don't know, what time is it right now? Perfect. So we, we can be done in like, uh, you know, we'll just do this exercise and we'll finish up and we'll be good. Is that good with you? All right. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to form right now, this will be artificial, I want you to form a triad. Okay? Just get two other, well, it could be a triad or it could be a quad. That's how you're doing it. So you can get, you know, you, your, your groups are close to that already, but you might have to divide out a few more, right? So I want you to get two other people or three other people, get a group. I want you to take out Matthew 11, 28 to 30 in that group. And I want you on your sheet of paper somewhere, if you can find a spot. I don't know if there's a spot, I, I think. Maybe not, but find, find a place. I want you to, first of all, I want you to all to read that passage out loud in your group. Then I want you to write it in your own words. You getting this? 
So the first thing you need to do is a triad. You're going to get together, you know, Matthew 11, 28, 30. Someone will read it out loud. Then everybody in the group is going to write it in their own words. Okay? Then I want you to come back here to me, and we're going to do something together with that. Okay? Yeah, you can just... Uh, yeah, it'd probably be good if it's guys with guys, girls with girls, right? Because that'd be, that'd be, that's how we're going to do it in the church, I think, right? So let's do that. Guys with guys, girls with girls, make triads and quads right now. Go. Find your new best friend and go do it. All right. Are you guys done writing your own words? Still writing your own words? Yeah, here's what I want you to do. Stay right where you are. Don't move. Um, now I want you to do two things for me next. In your groups, I want you to, to each read the passage that you just wrote in your own words to your partners. And then I want you to talk about this with, with your partners. What does this passage teach you about God? And what does this passage teach you about people? Okay? Oh. Okay. Um, so why don't you come back to your seats and we'll just do a little reflecting on this and then we'll finish up. I want to hear about your experience. So, so someone tell me, you know, here's the thing. I think that we, we do a lot with God's Word, but I don't think it often gets into our ears. We don't often hear God. The whole point of reading the Bible is that we hear the person who wrote the Bible, right, who is God Himself. We want to hear His Word. We want to hear the living Word through the written Word. I think when you're with other people, I think something unique happens when you read the Bible with three people versus just by yourself. So I want to hear your experience. Tell me what, what happened just now in your group. Did you get, give me, give me some reflections on that experience, if you have any. You don't hear. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're starting to tell your story again. How did it go reading out your own version of the scripture passage to each other? How did that go for you? Yeah. How was that? Yeah, was it interesting? Was that Yeah, that was interesting to hear how people hear the word of God differently and how they write this out and then you kind of go, "Whoa." Now look, folks, this that I just walked you through, this is being used all over the world in other places with Muslims and other people in other religions. They're having great success having them find Jesus through simply reading the Bible, writing their own words. They ask him five questions. I only gave you two. What does it teach you about God? What does it teach you about people? If you thought this was true, what would this, how would this apply to your life? What does it teach you to avoid or confess? And who will you share this, what you learn today, with tomorrow? And they're doing this all over the world, rapidly moving, disciple-making movements, are using this simple approach, and people's lives are being altered. So again, we make this complicated. The ancient way is not complicated. I can send Matt, I'll send you, we've, we've been making these cards at Cute Place around all kinds of different Bible stuff. I'll send you some of these you can use for your triads to use. So I think this is a brilliant way to get in the Bible together because now there's not a Bible lecture man in their group, which is usually happens, right? You get in a group of people, usually some guy's an expert, he's got all the things to say, but if you're just doing this, you're each writing out your own words, you're each giving your thoughts, you're, you're, you're working together to hear what God might be saying to your group, okay? And the Lord will speak because he's faithful to speak when his people gather in his name and he's in the middle of them, right? So it's good. So again, I'm giving you some tools, some handles I want to do in your triads. What can you do in these triads? Well, these are some things you can do. Yeah. Yep. 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 Good. Yeah, it's interesting in the Jewish synagogue ancient services, I learned this in Israel, they read the scripture for 40 minutes and they preached for two. 
We do the opposite. <laughs> we read two minutes of Scripture and preach for 40. I don't know what that says about us, but it was interesting to me to hear how they did this. They would just bring the Bible out. They'd march it around and dance it around. They'd read it and read it and read it and read it, and then they, the guy would get up. Like, remember Jesus' sermon in Luke 4 on Isaiah 61? He just says, today, in your hearing, this has been fulfilled. That's his sermon. <laughs> and he sits down. Boom! <laughs> up for grabs, right? So that's pretty amazing. So, all right, so that's, that's, that's this, right? So we got these, getting these pictures of what we can do in our triads. I'll give you two more. Obviously, this is an easy one, prayer. Um, here's D Dallas Willard. The open secret of many Bible-believing churches is that a vanishingly small percentage of those talking about prayer and Bible reading are actually doing what they're talking about. So we, we talk about prayer a lot. Where do you go to intentionally pray with other people in your church? Where's the time blocked out for that? It doesn't happen. And again, we wonder why our churches are just kind of limping along. We're not really doing these things that the ancient church did. We've kind of left them off the radar. Right? So try a chance to come together and do this. Look at this guy, uh, Dwight Edwards. Samuel Chadwick said the devil's one concern is to keep saints from prayer. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. If we want to be men and women of supernatural influence, one of the most foundational pursuits of our lives must be spirit-dependent, spirit-energized prayer that links us dependently with God. It's another thing you do in your triads. Spend some time in prayer. Okay? One last thing is a mission. Um, and this is what Q Place is all about. So if you take these steps, we want triads who have become solidified together to go out and form Q Place groups with their neighbors. So in other words, we want three Christians to say, we're going to go in our neighborhood now. We're going to invite other people into this conversation that we've started. But there are going to be people that don't believe the same things we believe. They believe different things. And we're going to ask them questions. And we're going to do these Bible things. This simple Bible study thing that I just showed you, I'm doing this with eight of my neighbors who are not Christians. They're sitting in my living room now after a year of fighting me on it. First we just had a spiritual conversation. They wouldn't read the Bible. Now we're reading the Bible. They're writing it in their own words. And they're hearing God for themselves without me saying one word. This is the... This is the foundation of what Q Place is all about. We're about questions and letting God speak for himself and do his thing. Okay? It takes a lot of the onus off me. Now I don't have to make something happen. I don't have to fix these people. I don't have to preach at them. You know, and they keep asking questions and I keep getting to share more of my story and more of what I believe. And it's based on their questions and curiosity versus me shoving it down their throat. So that's what Q Place is about. So ultimately, I don't know if this is Pastor Matt's goal, but my goal in coming here this weekend was that someday there'll be Q places in this church. And there'll be triads of people who are out in their neighborhoods having conversations with people that believe differently. Now, you talk about being on a mission of God. Just imagine if only three Q places formed in this church. That'd be nine Christians in spiritual conversation with 30 non-Christians overnight. That'd be life, that'd be neighborhood-changing stuff. That's world-changing kind of stuff. Now, I'll finish with this. The Bible's full of triads. Peter, James, and John. Remember they had a lot of experiences with Jesus that no one else did? He took them, you know, into the room where they healed the girl and resurrected her from the dead. He took them up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He took them into the, deeper into the garden. Um, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, that one kind of splintered when John Mark left the path, right? Uh, Silas and Timothy and Paul became a triad. My favorite one, maybe, my favorite quad in the Bible is Aaron, um, Joshua, Her, um, Aaron, Joshua, Her, and Moses. And remember when they're fighting the battle and Moses has got his arms up like this? And his arms get tired. And Joshua's down there fighting. And every time he drops his arm, poor Joshua's in trouble because now he doesn't have the power of God. And so Aaron and Her, they grab his arms and they hold him up. And I think that's a great picture of a triad. is us holding up each other's arms. If that's all we do in a triad, that's probably pretty valuable. That's probably pretty, pretty life-changing. So maybe you just start there. Get with two people, three people, and start holding up each other's arms. And see if you can, you know, find some life change. All right? All right. Can I pray for you guys? All right. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, 
I thank you for this church here in Gross Point Woods, Lord. I thank you for um, the way they're pursuing you, Lord, and your mission, Lord. Thank you for the leadership that's here, Pat and Jason and, and Nate. I, I'm sorry, Matt and Jason and Nate. And I just thank you, Lord, for the way that you're using their leadership to instill this movement here, Lord. I pray that we would not just leave here now, Lord, and do nothing. I pray, Lord Jesus, for these people that we would form triads, that we would take a step of action, that we would do something to live differently, to be obedient, to close the gap between what we know and what we do. Please, Lord, so that your spiritual power can be released in this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for having me, guys.